Chapter 5 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5 Notation I entreat my readers not to be frightened at the first sight of the notation I employ, for it is really very simple to understand and easy to recollect. It was impossible for me to get on without the help of something of the sort, as I found our ordinary nomenclature far too ambiguous as well as cumbrous for employment in this book. For example, the terms uncle, nephew, grandfather and grandson have each of them two distinct meanings. An uncle may be the brother of the father or the brother of the mother. The nephew may be the son of a brother or the son of a sister and so on. There are four kinds of first cousins, namely the sons of the two descriptions of uncles and those of the two corresponding aunts. There are sixteen kinds of first cousins once removed. For either upper A may be the son of any one of the four descriptions of male or of the four female cousins of upper B, or upper B may bear any one of those relationships to upper A. I need not quote more instances in allusion of which I have said that unbound confusion would have been introduced had I confined myself to this book, to our ordinary nomenclature. The notation I employ gets rid of all this confused and cumbrous language. It disentangles relationships in a marvellously complete and satisfactory manner and enables us to methodise, compare, and analyse them in any way we like. Speaking generally, and without regarding the type in which the letters are printed, F stands for father, G for grandfather, U for uncle, N for nephew, B for brother, S for son, and P for grandson. Petit fills in French. These letters are printed in capitals when the relationship is to be expressed as passed through the male line, and in small type when through the female line. Therefore, uppercase u is a parental uncle uppercase g the parental grandfather uppercase n is a nephew that is son of a brother uppercase p a grandson that is the child of a son so again lowercase u is the maternal uncle lowercase g the maternal grandfather lowercase n a nephew that is son of a sister lowercase p a grandson that is the child of a daughter Precisely the same letters in the form of italics are employed for the female relations. For example, in correspondence with uppercase U, there is uppercase U in italics to express an aunt that is the sister of a father, and to lowercase U, there is lowercase U in italics to express an aunt that is the sister of a mother. It is a consequence of this system of notation that uppercase F and uppercase B and uppercase S are always printed in capitals, and that their correlatives of mother, sister and daughter are always expressed in small italicized type as lowercase f, b and s. The reader must mentally put the word his before the letter denoting kinship, and was after it, thus Adams John, second president of the United States, S. John Quincy Adams, sixth president, P. C. F. Adams. American Minister in England, author, would be read his. John Adams, son was J. Q. Adams, his grandson was C. F. Adams. The following table comprises the whole of this notation. A table is displayed on the page showing a family tree, hypothetical form, with the described person set in the middle. Branches of son, daughter, brother, sister, mother and father all lead in opposite directions. Two or more letters are employed to express relationships beyond the compass of this table. Thus the expression for a first cousin, speaking generally, is uppercase US, which admits of being specialised in four different forms, namely uppercase US, uppercase italic US, lowercase u uppercase S, and lowercase u in italic, and uppercase S in italic. As a matter of fact, distant relationships will seldom be found to fall under our consideration. The last explanation I have to make is the meaning of brackets, when they enclose a letter. It implies that the person to whose name the letter in brackets is annexed has not achieved sufficient public reputation to be ranked, in statistical deductions, on equal terms with the rest. For facility of reference, I give lists in alphabetical order of all the letters within the limits of two letters that I employ. Thus I always use uppercase GF for great-grandfather, not uppercase FG, which means the same thing. Alphabetical list of the letters and the male relationships to which they correspond. Uppercase B, brother. F, father. G, grandfather. G, B, great uncle. G, F, great grandfather. G, G, great great grandfather. G, N, first cousin once removed ascending. G, U, great great uncle. 
N. F. U. N. S. Great nephew. P. Grandson. P. S. Great grandson. P. P. Great great grandson. S. Son. U. Uncle. U. P. First cousin once removed descending. U. S. First cousin. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on a volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6 The Judges of England between 1660 and 1865. The Judges of England since the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 form a group peculiarly well adapted to afford a general outline of the extent and limitations of hereditary in respect to genius. A judgeship is a guarantee of its professor being gifted with exceptional ability. The judges are sufficiently numerous and prolific to form an adequate basis for statistical inductions, and they are the subjects of several excellent biographical treatises. It is therefore well to begin our inquiries with a discussion of their relationships. We shall quickly arrive at definite results, which subsequent chapters, treating of more illustrious men, and in other careers, will check and amplify. It is necessary that I should first say something in support of my assertion, that the office of a judge is really a sufficient guarantee that its professor is exceptionally gifted. In other countries it may be different to what it is with us, but we all know that in England the bench is never spoken of without reference to the intellectual power of its occupiers. A seat on the bench is a great prize to be won by the best men. No doubt there are hindrances, external to those of nature, against a man getting on at the bar and rising to a judgeship. The attorneys may not give him briefs when he is a young barrister, and even if he becomes a successful barrister, his political party may be out of office for a long period, at a time when he was otherwise ripe for advancement. I cannot, however, believe that either of these are serious obstacles in the long run. Sterling ability is sure to make itself felt, and to lead to practice, while as to politics the changes of party are sufficiently frequent to give a fair chance to almost every generation. For every man who is a judge, there may possibly be two other lawyers of the same standing, equally fitted for the post, but it is hard to believe there can be a larger number. If not always the foremost, the judges are therefore among the foremost, of a vast body of legal men. The census speaks of upwards of 3,000 barristers, advocates, and special pleaders, and it must be recollected that those who do not consist of 3,000 men taken at haphazard, but a large part of them are already selected, and it is from these, by a second process of selection, that the judges are mainly derived. When I say that a large part of the barristers are selected men, I speak of those among them who are of humble parentage, but have brilliant natural gifts, who attract and notice as boys or it may be even as children and were therefore sent to a good school there they won exhibitions and fitted themselves for college where they supported themselves by obtaining scholarships then came fellowships and so they ultimately found their way to the bar many of these have risen to the bench the parentage of the lord chancellors justifies my statement there have been thirty of them within the period included in my inquiries of these lord hardwick was the son of a small attorney at dover in narrow circumstances, Lord Eldon, whose brother was the great almighty judge Lord Stowell, the son of a coal fitter, Lord Truro, was the son of a sheriff's officer, and Lord St. Leonard's, like Lord Tenderton, and Chief Justice of Common Pleas, was son of a barber. Others were sons of clergymen of scanty means. Others have begun life in alien professions, yet notwithstanding their false start, have easily recovered lost ground in after life. Lord Erskine, was first in the navy and then in the army, before he became a barrister. Lord Chemsford was originally a midshipman. Now a large number of men with antecedents as unfavourable to success as these, and yet successful men are always to be found at the bar, and therefore I say the barristers are themselves a selected body, and the fact of every judge having been taken from the foremost rank of three thousand of them is proof that his exceptional ability is of an enormously higher order than if the three thousand barristers had been conscripts drawn by lot from the general mass of their countrymen i therefore need not trouble myself with quoting passages from biographies to prove that each of the judges whose name i have occasion to mention is a highly gifted man it is precisely in order to avoid the necessity of this tedious work that i have selected the judges for my first chapter in speaking of the english judges i have adopted the well-known lives of the judges by foss as my guide it was published in eighteen sixty five so i have adopted that date as the limit of my inquiries 
I have considered those only as falling under the definition of judges whom he includes as such. They are the judges of the courts of chancery and common law, and the masters of the rolls, but not the judges of the admiralty nor of the court of Canterbury. By the latter limitation I lose the advantage of counting Lord Stowell, brother of Lord Chancellor Eldon, the remarkable family of the Lushingtons, that of Sir R. Fillimore, and some others. Though the limitations as regards time, I lose by ending with the year 1863 the recently created judges, such as Judge Selwyn, brother of the Bishop of Lichfield, and also Professor of Divinity at Cambridge. But I believe from cursory inquiries that the relations of these latter judges, speaking generally, have not so large a share of eminence as we shall find among those of the judges in my list. This might have been expected, for it is notorious that the standard of ability in a modern judge is not so high as it used to be. The number of exceptionally gifted men being the same, it is impossible to supply the new demand for heads of great schools and for numerous other careers now thrown open to able use, without seriously limiting the field whence alone good judges may be selected. By beginning at the restoration which I took for my commencement, because there was frequent jobbery in earlier days, I lose a Lord Keeper, of the same rank as Lord Chancellor, and his still greater son, also a Lord Chancellor, namely the two Bacons. I state these facts to show that I have not picked out the period in question because it seemed most favourable to my argument, but simply because it appeared the most suitable to bring out the truth as to hereditary genius, and was at the same time most convenient for me to discuss. There are 286 judges within the limits of my inquiry. 109 of them have one or more eminent relations, and three others have relations whom I have noticed, but they are marked off with brackets and are therefore not to be included in the following statistical deductions. As a readiest method of showing at a glance the way in which these relations are distributed, I give a table below in which they are all compactly registered. The table is a condensed summary of the appendix to the present chapter, which should be consulted by the reader whenever he desires fuller information. The table is displayed on the page. Table 1. Summary of relationships of 109 judges grouped into 85 families. There are three sections with one relation or two in family, two and three relations or three and four in family, and four or more relations or five and more in family. Several remarkable features in the contents of this table will catch the eye at once. I will begin by shortly alluding to them, and will enter more into details a little further on. First, it will be observed that the judges are so largely interrelated that 109 of them are grouped into only 85 families. There are 17 doublets among the judges, 2 triplets, and 1 quadruplet. In addition to these, might be counted 6 other sets consisting of those whose ancestors sat on the bench previously to the ascension of Charles II, namely Beddingfield, Forster, Hyde, Finch, Windham, and Leiterton. Another fact to be observed is the nearness of the relationships in my list. The single letters are far the most common, also though a man has twice as many grandfathers as fathers, and probably more than twice as many grandsons as sons, yet the judges are found more frequently to have eminent fathers than grandfathers, and eminent sons than grandsons. In the third degree of relationship the eminent kinsmen are yet more rare, although the number of individuals in those degrees is increased in a duplicate proportion. When a judge has no more than one eminent relation, that relation is nearly always to be found in the first or second degree. Thus, in the first section of the table, which is devoted to single relationships, though it includes as many as 39 entries, there are only two among them, viz. Brown and Lord Brougham, whose kinships extend beyond the second degree. It is in the last section of the table, which treats of whole families largely gifted with ability, that the distinct kinships are chiefly to be found. I annex a table, table 2, extracted from the preceding one, which exhibits these facts with great clearness. Column A contains the facts just as they were observed, and column D shows the percentage of individuals in each degree of kinship to every 100 judges who have become eminent. Table 2 is displayed on the page. It shows several sections with degrees of kinship subdivided to the name of the degree and the corresponding letter. An additional five columns with uppercase A, B, C, D, and E. A. Number of eminent men in each degree of kinship in the most eminent man of the family, 85 families. B. The preceding column lays in proportion to 100 families. C. Number of individuals in each degree of kinship to 100 men. D. 
percentage of eminent men in each degree of kinship to the most eminent member of distinguished families it was obtained by dividing b by c and multiplying by one hundred e percentages of previous column reduced to the proportion of two hundred eighty six minus twenty four or two hundred forty two to eighty five in order to apply to families generally table two also gives materials for judging of the comparative influence of the male and female lines in conveying ability thanks to my method of notation it is perfectly easy to separate the two lines in the way i am about to explain i do not attempt to compare relations in the first degree of kinship namely fathers with mothers sons with daughters or brothers with sisters because there exists no criterion for a just comparison of the natural ability of the different sexes nay even if there were means for testing it the result would be fallacious a mother transmits masculine peculiarities to a male child which she does not and cannot possess and similarly a woman who is endowed with fewer gifts of a masculine type than her husband may yet contribute in a larger degree to the masculine intellectual superiority of her son i therefore shift my inquiry from the first to the second and third degrees of kinship as regards the second degree i compare the paternal grandfather with the maternal an uncle by the father's side with the uncle by the mother's the nephew by the brother's side with the nephew by the sisters and the grandson by the son with the grandson by the daughter on the same principle i compare the kinships in the third degree that is to say the father with the father's father with the father of the mother's mother and so on the whole of the work is distinctly exposed to view in the following compact table in the second degree seven uppercase g plus nine uppercase u plus fourteen uppercase n plus eleven uppercase p equals forty one kinships through males six lowercase g plus six lowercase u plus two lowercase n plus five lowercase p equals nineteen kinships through females in the third degree one uppercase g f plus one uppercase g b plus five uppercase u s plus seven uppercase n s plus two uppercase p s equals nineteen kinships through males zero lowercase g upper f plus zero lower g upper b plus one lower u upper case s plus zero lower n upper s plus zero lower p upper s equals one kinships through females total sixty through males twenty through females the numbers are too small to warrant any very decided conclusion but they go far to prove that the female influence is inferior to that of the male in conveying ability it must however be observed that the difference between the totals in the second degree is chiefly due to the nephews a relationship difficult to trace on the female side because as a matter of fact biographers do not speak so fully of the descendants of the sisters of their hero as that of his brothers as regards the third degree the relationships on the female side are much more difficult to ferret out than those on the male and i have no doubt i have omitted many of them in my earlier attempts the balance stood still more heavily against the female side and it has been reduced exactly in proportion to the number of times i have revised my data consequently though i first suspected a large residuum against the female line i think there is reason to believe the influence of females but little inferior to that of males in transmitting judicial ability it is of course a grief to me in writing this book that circumstances make it impossible to estimate the influence of the individual peculiarities of the mother for good or for bad upon her offspring they appear to me for the reasons stated to be as important elements in the inquiry as those of the father and yet i am obliged to completely ignore them in a large majority of instances on account of the lack of reliable information nevertheless i have numerous arguments left to prove that genius is hereditary before going further i must entreat my readers to abandon any objection which very likely may present itself to their minds and which i can easily show to be untenable people who do not realize the nature of my arguments have constantly spoken to me to this effect it is of no use your quoting successes unless you take failures into equal account eminent men may have eminent relations but they also have very many who are ordinary or even stupid and there are not a few who are either eccentric or downright mad i perfectly allow all this but does not in the least affect the cogency of my arguments if a man breeds from strong well-shaped dogs but of mixed pedigree puppies will be sometimes but rarely the equals of their parents they will commonly be of a mongrel nondescript type because ancestral peculiarities are apt to crop out in the offspring 
yet notwithstanding all this it is easy to develop the desirable characteristics of individual dogs into the assured heirloom of a new breed the breeder selects the puppies that most nearly approach the wished-for type generation after generation until they have no ancestor within many degrees that has objectionable peculiarities so it is with men and women because one or both of a child's parents are able it does not in the least follow as a matter of necessity but only as one of moderately unfavourable odds that the child will be able also he inherits an extraordinary mixture of qualities displayed in his grandparents great-grandparents and more remote ancestors as well as from those of his father and mother the most illustrious and so-called well-bred families of the human race are utter mongrels as regards the natural gifts of intellect and disposition what i profess to prove is this that if two children are taken of whom one is a parent exceptionally gifted in a high degree say as one in four thousand or as one in a million and the other has not the former child has an enormous greater chance of turning out to be gifted in a high degree than the other also i argue that as a new race can be obtained from in animals and plants and can be raised and so great a degree of purity that it will maintain itself with moderate care in preventing the more faulty members of the flock from breeding so a race of gifted men might be obtained under exactly similar conditions i must apologize for anticipating in this off-hand and very imperfect manner the subject of a further chapter by these few remarks but i am really obliged to do so knowing from experience how pertinaciously strangers to be reasoning by which the laws hereditary are established are inclined to prejudge my conclusions by blindly assisting that the objection to which i have referred has overbearing weight i will now proceed with an examination of what may be learnt from the relationships of the judges first i would ask are the abler judges more rich in eminent relations than those who are less able there are two ways of answering this question as to examine into the relationships of the law lords as compared with that of the pusine judges or of the chancellors compared with that of the judges generally and the other is to determine whether or no the persons whose names are entered in the third column of table one are above the average of judges in respect to ability here are a few of the lord chancellors there are only thirty of those high legal officers within the limits of my inquiry yet twenty-four of these have eminent relations whereas out of the two hundred eighty six minus thirty or two hundred and fifty six other judges only one hundred and fourteen minus twenty four or ninety have eminent relations there are therefore eighty per cent of the chancellors as compared to thirty six per cent of the rest of the judges that have eminent relations the proportion would have been greater if i had compared the chancellors or the chancellors with the other law lords with the pristine judges the other test i proposed is equally satisfactory there can be no doubt of the exceptionally eminent ability of the men whose names appear in the third column to those who object to my conclusion because lord chancellors have more opportunities of thrusting relatives by jobbery into eminence than are possessed by the other judges i can do no more than refer them to what i have already said about the reputation being a test of ability and by giving a short list of the more remarkable cases of relations to the lord chancellors which i think will adequately meet their objection they are one earl bathurst and his daughter's son the famous judge sir f buller two earl camden and his father chief justice pratt three earl clarendon and the remarkable family of hyde in which were two uncles and one cousin all english judges besides one welsh judge and many other men of the distinction four earl cowper his brother the judge and his great nephew the poet five earl eldon and his brother lord stowell six lord erskine his eminent legal brother the lord advocate of scotland and his son the judge seven earl nottingham and the most remarkable family of finch eight nine ten earl hardwick and his son also a lord chancellor who died suddenly and that son's great uncle lord somers also a lord chancellor eleven lord herbert his son a judge his cousins lord herbert of cherbury and george the poet and divine twelve lord king and his uncle lord locke the philosopher thirteen the infamous but most able lord jeffreys had a cousin just like him namely sir j trevor master of the rolls fourteen lord guildford is member of a family to which i simply despair of doing justice for it is linked with connexations of such marvellous ability judicial and statesmanlike as to deserve a small volume to describe it it contains thirty first-class men in near kinship including montagues sydneys herberts dudleys and others fifteen 
Lord Truro had two able legal brothers, one of whom was Chief Justice of the Cape of Good Hope, and his nephew is an English judge recently created Lord Penzance. I will here mention Lord Littleton, Lord Keeper of Charles I, although many members of his most remarkable family do not fall within my limits. His father, the Chief Justice of North Wales, married a lady, the daughter of Sir J. Walter, the Chief Justice of South Wales, and also sister of an English judge. She bore him Lord Keeper Littleton and Sir Timothy a judge. Lord Lutterton's daughter, son, she married a cousin, was Sir T. Lutterton, the Speaker of the House of Commons. There is therefore abundant reason to conclude that the King's men of Lord Chancellors are far richer in natural gifts than those of the other judges. I will now take another test of the existence of hereditary ability. Here is a comparison of the entries in the column of Table 1. Supposing that natural gifts were due to mere accident, unconnected with parentage, then the entries will be distributed in accordance with the law that governs the distribution of accidents. If it be a hundred to one against some member of any family within given limits of kinship, drawing a lottery prize, it would be a million to one against three members of the same family doing so, nearly but not exactly because the size of the family is limited, and a million millions to one against six members doing so. Therefore, if natural gifts were due to mere accident, the first column of table one would have been enormously longer than the second column, and the second column enormously longer than the third. But they are not so. There are nearly as many cases of two or three eminent relations as one of eminent relation, and, as is set off against the thirty-nine cases that appear in the first column, there are no less than fifteen cases in the third. It is therefore clear that ability is not distributed at haphazard, but that it clings to certain families. We will proceed to a third test. If genius be hereditary, as I assert it to be, the characteristics that make a judge ought to be frequently transmitted to his descendants. The majority of judges belong to a strongly marked type. They are not men who are carried away by sentiment, who love seclusion and dreams, but they are prominent members of a very different class, one that Englishmen are especially prone to honour for at least the six lawful days of the week. I mean that they are vigorous, shrewd, practical, helpful men, glorying the rough and tumble of public life, tough in constitution and strong in digestion valuing what money brings aiming at position and influence and desiring to found families the vigour of a judge is testified by the fact that the average age of their appointment in the last three reigns has been fifty seven the labour and responsibility of the office seem enormous to lookers-on yet these elderly men continue working with ease for many more years their average age of death is seventy five and they commonly die in harness now are these remarkable gifts and peculiarities inherited by their sons do the judges often have sons who succeed in the same career, where success would have been impossible if they had not been gifted with the special qualities of their fathers? The best answer is a list of names. It will be of much interest to legal readers. Others can glance over them and go on to the results. A list is provided judges of England and other high legal officers between 1660 and 1865, who were or are related. It includes fathers, sons, brothers, and grandfathers. Out of the 286 judges, more than one in every nine of them have been either father, son or brother to another judge, and the other high legal relationships have been even more numerous. There cannot then remain a doubt but that the particular type of ability that is necessary to a judge is often transmitted by descent. The reader must guard himself against the supposition that because the judges have so many legal relations, therefore they have few other relations of eminence in other walks of life. A long list might be made out of those who had bishops and archbishops for kinsmen. No less than ten judges, of whom one, Sir Robert Hyde, appeared in the previous list, have a bishop or an archbishop for a brother. Of these, Sir William Dolben was brother to one archbishop of York, and son of the sister of another, namely of John Williams, who was also the Lord Keeper to James I. There are cases of poet relations, as Cowper, Coleridge Milton, Sir Thomas Overbury, and Waller. There are numerous relatives who are novelists, physicians, admirals, and generals. My list of kinsmen at the end of this chapter are very briefly treated, but they include the names of many great men whose deeds have filled large volumes. It is one of my most serious drawbacks in writing this book to feel that names, which never now present themselves to my eye without associations of respect and reverence for the great qualities of those who bore them, are likely to be insignificant and meaningless to the eyes of most of my readers indeed to all those who have never had occasion to busy themselves with their history 
i know how great was my own ignorance of the character of the great men of previous generations therefore i occupied myself with the biographies and i therefore reasonably suspect that many of my readers will be no better informed about them than i was myself a collection of men that i have learned to look upon as an august valhalla is likely to be regarded by those who are strangers to the facts of biographical history as an assemblage of mere respectabilities the names of north and montagu among the judges introduce us to a remarkable breed of eminent men set forth at length in the genealogical tree of the montagues and again in that of the sydney's literary men to whose natural history if the expression be permitted a few pages may be profitably assigned there is hardly a name in those pedigrees which is not more than ordinarily eminent many are illustrious they are closely tied together in their kinship and they extend through ten generations the main roots of this diffused ability lie in the families of sydney and montagu and in a less degree in that of north the sydney blood i mean that of the descendants of sir william sydney and his wife had extraordinary influence in two different combinations first with the dudleys producing in the first generation sir philip sydney and his eminent brother and sister second generation at least one eminent man and in the third generation algernon sydney with his able brother and much be praised sister the second combination of the sydney blood was with the harringtons producing in the first generation a literary peer and elizabeth the mother of the large and most remarkable family that forms the chief future in my genealogical table the montagu blood as represented by sir edward who died in the tower sixteen forty four is derived from three distinct sources his great-grandfather lowercase g uppercase f was sir john phoenix chief justice of the king's bench his grandfather lowercase g was john roper attorney-general to henry the eighth and his father by far the most eminent of the three was sir edward montagu chief justice of the king's bench sir edward montagu son of the chief justice married elizabeth harrington of whom i have just spoken and a large family who in themselves and in their descendants became most remarkable to mention only the titles they won in the first generation they obtained two peerages the earldom of manchester and the barony of montagu in the second they obtained two more the earldom of sandwich and the barony of capel in the third five more the dukedom of montagu earldoms of halifax and of essex the barony of guildford and the new barony of capel second creation in the fourth one more the dukedom of manchester the premier in 1701 in the fifth one more the earldom of guildford the second earl of guildford the premier of george iii best known as lord north was in the sixth generation it is wholly impossible for me to describe the characteristics of all the individuals who were jotted down in my genealogical tree i cannot do it without giving a vast deal more room than i can spare but this much i can do and ought to do namely to take those who are most closely linked with the judges and to show that they possessed sterling ability and did not hold their high positions by mere jobbery nor obtain their reputations through the accident of birth or circumstances i will gladly undertake to show this although it happens in the present instance to put my cause in a peculiarly disadvantageous light because francis north the lord keeper the first baron guildford is the man of all others in the high position identical nearly so with that of a lord chancellor who modern authorities vie in disparaging and condemning those who oppose my theories might say the case of north being lord keeper shows it is impossible to trust official rank as criterion of ability he was promoted by jobbery and jobbed when he was promoted he inherited family influence not natural intellectual gifts and the same may be said of all the members of this or any other pedigree as i implied before there is another truth in this objection to make it impossible to meet it by a flat contradiction based on a plain and simple statement it is necessary to analyse characters and to go a little into detail i will do this and when it is concluded i believe many of my readers will better appreciate than they did before how largely natural intellectual gifts are the birthright of some families francis north the lord keeper was one of a family of five brothers and one sister the lives of three of the brothers are familiarly known to us through the charming biographies written by another brother roger north their position in the montagu family is easily discovered by means of the genealogical tree they fall in the third of those generations i have just described the one in which the family gained one dukedom two earldoms and two baronies their father was of a literary stock continued backwards in one line during no less than five generations 
the first lord north was an eminent lawyer in the time of queen elizabeth and his son an able man as an ambassador married the daughter of lord chancellor rich his son again who did not live to enjoy the peerage married the daughter of a master of the court of requests and his great-great-grandsons the intermediate links being more or less distinguished but of whose marriages i know little were the brothers north of whom i am about to speak the father of these brothers was the fourth baron north he was a literary man and among other matters wrote the life of the founder of his family he was an economical man and an exquisitely virtuous and sober in his person the style of his writings was not so bright as that of his father the second baron who was described as full of spirit and flame and who was an author both in prose and verse his poems were praised by walpole the mother of the brothers namely Anne montagu is described by her son as a compendium of charity and wisdom i suspect it was from the fourth baron north that the disagreeable qualities in three of the brothers north were derived such as a priggishness of the lord keeper and that curious saving mercantile spirit that appeared under different forms in the lord keeper the financer and the master of trinity college i cannot avoid alluding to these qualities for they are prominent features in their characters and find a large place in their biographies in speaking of the lord keeper i think i had better begin with the evil part of his character when that has been omitted and done with the rest of my task will be pleasant and interesting in short the lord keeper is mercilessly handled in respect to his public character lord campbell calls him the most dubious man that had ever held the great seal and says that throughout his whole life he sought and obtained advancement by the meanest arts bishop burnet calls him crafty and designing lord macaulay accuses him of selfishness cowardice and meanness i have heard of no writer who commends his public character except his brother who was tenderly attached to him i should say that even lord campbell acknowledges the lord keeper to have been extremely amiable in all his domestic relations and that nothing can be more touching than the account we have of the warm and steady affection between him and his brother who survived to be his biographer i am however no further concerned with the lord keeper's public character than to show that notwithstanding his most unworthy acts to obtain advancement and notwithstanding he had relatives in high offices to help him his own ability and that of his brother's was truly remarkable bishop burnet says of him that he had not the virtues of his predecessor lord nottingham but he had parts far beyond him however lord campbell dissents from this and remarks that a nottingham does not arise above once in a century i will here beg the reader not to be unmindful of the marvellous hereditary gifts of the nottingham or finch family macaulay says his intellect was clear his industry great his proficiency in letters and science respectable and his legal learning more than respectable his brother roger writes thus of the lord keeper's youth it was singular and remarkable in him that together with the study of the law which is thought ordinarily to devour the whole studious time of a young gentleman he continued to pursue his inquiries into all ingenious arts history humanity and languages whereby he became not only a good lawyer but a good historian politician mathematician natural philosopher and i must add musician in perfection the honorary sir dudley north his younger brother was a man of exceedingly high abilities and vigour he went as youth through smyrna where his good works are not yet forgotten and where he made a large fortune then returning to england he became at once a man of the highest note in parliament as a financer there was an unpleasant side to his character when young but he overmastered and outgrew it namely he first showed a strange bent to traffic when at school afterwards he cheated sadly and got into debts then he cheated his parents to pay the debts at last he made a vigorous effort and wholly reformed himself so that his brother concludes his biography in this way if i may be so free as to give my thoughts of his morals i must allow that as to all the mercantile arts and stratagems of trade that could be used to get money from those he dealt with i believe he was not niggard but as for falsities he was clear as any man living it seems from the same authority that he was a very forward lively and beautiful child at school he did not get on so well with his books as he had an excessive desire for action still his ability was such that a little application went a long way with him he came out a moderate scholar he was a great swimmer and could live in the water for a whole afternoon i mention this because i shall hereafter have occasion to speak of physical gifts not unfrequently accompanying intellectual ones he sometimes left his clothes in charge of a porter below london bridge then ran naked upon the mud shore of the thames up along as high as chelsea for the pleasure of swimming down to his clothes with the tide and he loved to end by shooting the cascade beneath old london bridge 
I often marvelled at his feet when I happened to be on the river in a steamer. I will now quote Macaulay's description of his first appearance in his afterlife on the stage of English politics, speaking in his History of England, of the period immediately following the ascension of James II. Macaulay says, The person on whom devolved the task of devising ways and means was Sir Dudley North, younger brother of the Lord Keeper. Dudley North was one of the ablest men of his time. He had early in life been sent to the Levant, where he had long been engaged in mercantile pursuits. Most men would, in such a situation, have allowed their faculties to rust, for at Smyrna and Constantinople there were few books and few intelligent companions, but the young factor had one of those vigorous understandings which are independent of external aids. In his solitude he meditated deeply on the philosophy of trade, and thought out, by degrees, a complete and admirable theory, substantially the same with that which a hundred years later was expounded by Adam Smith. North was brought into Parliament for Banbury, and though a new member was the person on whom the Lord Treasurer chiefly relied for the conduct of financial business in the lower house. North's ready wit and perfect knowledge of trade prevailed, both in the Treasury and the Parliament, against all opposition. The old members were amazed at seeing a man who had not been a fortnight in the house, and whose life had been chiefly passed in foreign countries, assumed with confidence and discharged with ability all the functions of a Chancellor of the Echiquier. He was forty-four years old at the time. Roger North describes the financial theories of his brother thus. One is that trade is not disrupted by his government by nations and kingdoms, but is one throughout the whole world, as the main sea which cannot be emptied or replenished in one part, but the whole more or less would be affected. Another was concerning money, that no nation could want money, specie, and they would not abound in it, for if a people want money, they will give a price for it, and then merchants, for gain, bring it and lay it down before them. Roger North, speaking of Sir Dudley and of the Lord Keeper, says, These brothers lived with extreme satisfaction in each other's society, for both had the skill and knowledge of the world. As to all affairs relating to their several professions in perfection, and each was in Indies to the other, producing always the richest novelties, of which the best understandings are greedy. The Honorary Dr. John North, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, differed in some respects from his brothers, and resembled them in others. When he was very young, and also as he grew up, he was of a nice and tender constitution, not so vigorous and athletic as most of his brothers were. His temper was always reserved and studious. If anything so easily seemed to miss in him, he was a non-natural gravity, which in youth is seldom a good sign, for it argues imbecility of body and mind, or both. But his lay wholly in the former, for his mental capacity was vigorous as none more. Thus he became devoted to study and the whole of his expenditure went to books. In other respects, he was penurious and hoarding. Consequently, as his brother says, he was overmuch addicted to thinking, or else he performed it with more labour and tenseness than other men ordinarily do. He was, in a word, the most intense and passionate thinker that ever lived, and he was in his right mind. This ruined his health. His flesh was strangely flaccid and soft. His going weak and shuffling often crossed his legs as if it were tipsy. His sleep seldom or never easy but interrupted with unquiet and painful dreams. The reposes he had were short and by snatches. His active spirit had rarely any settlement or rest. It is evident that he played foolish tricks with his brain, and the result was that he had a stroke, and utterly broke up, decaying more and more in mind and body until death relieved him at estimate 38. There is no doubt that Dr. John North deserved more reputation than he has obtained, partially owing to his early death, and partially to his exceeding sensitiveness in respect to posthumous criticism. He left peremptory orders that all his MSS should be burnt. He appears to have been especially skilled in Greek and Hebrew scholarship. The Lord Caper and the Master of Trinity resembled each other in their painfully shy dispositions and studious tastes. The curious money-saving propensities were common to all three brothers. The indolent habits of the Master of Trinity were shared by Sir Dudley after his return from England who would take no exercise whatever, but sat all day either at home or else steering a little sailing vessel on the Thames. The Lord Keeper was always fanciful about his health. The Honorary Mary North, afterwards Lady Spring, was a sister of these brothers, and no less gifted than they. Roger North says, Besides the advantage of her person, she had a superior wit, prodigious memory, and was the most agreeable in conversation. 
she used to rehearse by heart prolix romances with the substance of speeches and letters as well as passages and this with little or no hesitation but in a continual series of discourse the very memory of which is to me at this day very wonderful she died not long after the birth of her first child and the child died not long after her roger north the biographer of his brothers from whom i have quoted so much was the author of other works and among them is a memoir on music showing that he had shared the musical faculty that was strongly developed in the lord keeper little is known of his private life he was attorney-general to the consort of james II. there can be no doubt as to his abilities the lives of the north is a work of no ordinary writer it is full of touches of genius and shrewd perception of character roger north seems to have been a most loving and lovable man charles the fifth lord north was the eldest of the family and succeeded to the title but he did not so far as i am aware show signs of genius however he had a daughter whose literary tastes were curiously similar to those of her uncle dr john she was studly a north who in the words of roger emaciated herself with study whereby she made familiar to her not only the greek and latin but the oriental languages she died early having collected a choice library of oriental works i will conclude this description of the family with a characteristically quaint piece of their biographer's preface rarely the case is memorable for the happy circumstance of a flock so numerous and diffuse as this of the last dudley lord north's was and no one scabby sheep in it the nearest collateral relation of the north family by the montagu side is charles hatton their first cousin he is alluded to three times in roger north's lives and each time with the same epithet the incomparable charles hutton why he was so distinguished there is no information but it is reasonable to accept roger north's estimate of his merits so far as to classify him among the gifted members of the montagu family i will mention only four more of the kinsmen of the norths the first is their great uncle sir henry montagu chief justice of the king's bench and created earl of manchester who was grandfather to james montagu upper class c low h upper class b upper class e g o three an uncle of William, upper class C, lower class H, upper B, upper E, Jace th second, both of whom are included in my list. Lord Clarendon says of Sir Henry that he was a man of great industry and sagacity in business, which he delighted in exceedingly and preserved so great a vigour of mind, even to his death, that some who had known him in his younger years did believe him to have much quicker parts in his age than before. The second Earl of Manchester, lower G, upper N, to the north was the Baron Kimbleton of Marston Moor, and, as Lord Campbell says, one of the most distinguished men who appeared in the most interesting period of our history, having, as Lord Kimbleton, vindicated the liberties of his country in the Senate, as Earl of Manchester in the field, and having afterwards mainly contributed to the suppression of anarchy by the restoration of the royal line. The first Earl of Sandwich, also lower g up n to the north was a gallant high admiral of england in the time of charles II. he began life as a soldier when only eighteen years of age with a parliamentary regiment that he himself had raised and he ended it in a naval battle against the dutch in southwold bay he also translated a spanish work on metallurgy i do not know that the book is of any value but the fact is worthy of notice as showing that he was more than a mere soldier or sailor the last of the eminent relations of the norths of whom i shall speak at length was the great-grandson of the eldest brother who became the famous premier the lord north of the time of the american war lord Brougham says that all contemporaries agree in representing his talents as having shown with a great and steady lustre during that singularly trying period he speaks of a wit that never failed him and a suavity of temper that could never be ruffled as peculiar qualities in which he and indeed all his family his immediate family excelled most other men the admirable description of lord north by his daughter lady charlotte lindsay that is appended to his biography by lord brougham is sufficient proof of that lady's high ability there is yet another great legal family related to the norths whose place in the pedigree i do not know is that of the hydes and includes the illustrious first earl of clarendon it appears that Lord Chief Justice Hyde used to take kindly notice of the Lord Keeper, Francis North, when a young rising barrister, and alluded to his kinship and called him cousin. It is want of space, not want of material, that compels me to conclude the description of the able relatives of the Norths and Montagues, but I am sure that I have said enough to prove the assertion, 
with which i prefaced it the natural gifts of an exceedingly high order were inherited by a very large number of the members of the family and that these owed their reputations to their abilities and not to family support another test of the truth of the hereditary character of ability is to see whether the near relations of very eminent men are more frequently eminent than those who are more remote table two page sixty one answers this question with great distinctness in the way i have already explained it shows that the near relations of the judges are far richer in ability than the more remote so much so that the fact of being born in the fourth degree of relationship is of no sensible benefit at all the data from which i obtain con c of the table are as follows i find that twenty three of the judges are reported to have had large families say consisting of four adult sons in each eleven are simply described as having issue say at the rate of one point five sons each and that the number of the sons of others are specified as amounting between them to one hundred eighty six forming thus far a total of two hundred ninety four in addition to these there are nine reported marriages of judges in which no allusion is made to children and there are thirty one judges in respect to whom nothing is said about marriage at all i think we are fairly justified from these data in concluding that each judge is father on a an average do not less than one son who lives in an age at which he might have distinguished himself if he had the ability to do so i also find the adult families to consist on an average of not less than two point five sons and two point five daughters each consequently each judge has an average of one point five brothers and two point five sisters from these data it is perfectly easy to reckon the number of kinsmen in each order thus the nephews consist of the brothers sons and the sisters sons now one hundred judges are supposed to have one hundred and fifty brothers and two hundred and fifty sisters and each brother and each sister to have on the average only one son consequently the one hundred judges will have one hundred and fifty plus two hundred and fifty or four hundred nephews i need not trouble the reader with more figures suffice it to say i have divided the total number of eminent kinsmen to one hundred judges by the number of kinsmen in each degree and from that division i obtain the column d in table two which I now project into a genealogical tree in Table 3. Table 3 is displayed on the page. Percentage of eminent men in each degree of kinship to the most gifted member of distinguished families. It will be observed that Table 3 refers only to distinguished families. If we modified it to correspond with Column E of Table 2, in which all the judges, whether they have distinguished relations or no, are considered the proportion between the eminent kinsmen in each different degree would be unchanged, though their absolute numbers would be reduced to about one-third of their value. Table 3 shows in the most unmistakable manner the enormous odds that a near kinsman has over one that is remote in the chance of inheriting ability. Speaking roughly, the percentages are quartered at each successive remove, whether by descent or collaterally. Thus, in the first degree of kinship, the percentage is about 28, in the second about 7, in the third 1.5 the table also testifies to another fact in which people do not commonly believe it shows that when we regard the averages of many instances the frequent sports of nature in producing prodigies must be regarded as apparent and not as real ability in the long run does not suddenly start into existence and disappear with equal abruptness but rather it rises in a gradual and regular curve out of the ordinary level of family life the statistics show that there is a regular average increase of ability in the generations that precede its culmination and as regular a decrease in those that succeed it in the first case the marriages have been consentient to its production in the latter they have been incapable of preserving it after three successive dilutions of the blood the descendants of the judges appear incapable of rising to eminence these results are not as surprising even when compared with the far greater length of kinship through which features of diseases may be transmitted ability must be based on a triple footing every leg of which has to be firmly planted in order that a man should inherit ability in the concrete he must inherit three qualities that are separate and independent of one another he must inherit capacity zeal and vigour for unless these three or at the very least two of them are combined he cannot hope to make a figure in the world the probability against inheriting a combination of three qualities not correlated together is necessarily in a triplicate proportion greater than it is against inheriting any one of them there is a marked difference between the percentage of ability in the grandsons of the judge when his sons the fathers of those grandsons have been eminent than when they have not 
let us suppose that the son of a judge wishes to marry what expectation has he that his own sons will become eminent men supporters of his family and not a burden to it in their after life in the case where the son of the judge is himself eminent i found out of the two hundred twenty six judges previous to the present reign twenty two whose sons have been distinguished men i do not count instances in the present reign because the grandsons of these judges are for the most part too young to have achieved distinction twenty two out of two hundred twenty six gives ten in one hundred as a percentage of the judges that have distinguished sons the reader will remark how near this result is to the nine point five as entered in my table showing the general truth of both estimates of these twenty two i count the following triplets the atkins family as two it is true that the grandfather was only chief justice of north wales and not an english judge but the vigour of the blood is proved by the line of not only his son and two grandsons being english judges but also by the grandson of one of them through the female line being an english judge also another line is that of the pratts viz the chief justice and his son the lord chancellor earl camden and his grandson the son of the earl created the marquis camden the latter was chancellor of the university of cambridge and a man of note in many ways another case is the york line for the son of the lord chancellor the earl of hardwick was charles york himself a lord chancellor his sons were able men one became first lord of the admiralty another was bishop of Ely. a third was a military officer of distinction and created baron dover a fourth was an admiral of distinction i will not count all these but will reckon them as three favourable instances the total thus far is six to which might be added in fairness something from that most remarkable montague family and its connections of which several judges but before and after the ascension of charles i were members however wish to be well within bounds and therefore will claim only six successes out of the twenty-two cases i allow one sign to each judge as before or one in four even under these limitations it is only four to one on the average against each child of an eminent son of a judge becoming di a distinguished man now for the second category where the son is not eminent but the grandson is there are only seven of these cases to the x minus twenty two or two hundred and four judges that remain and one or two of them are not of very high order they are the third earl shaftesbury author of the characteristics cowper the poet lord lechmere the attorney general sir uppercase w lower m mansfield commander-in-chief in india sir eardley wilmont who filled various offices with credit and was created a baronet and lord windham lord chancellor of ireland fielding the novelist was grandson of judge gould by the female line hence it is two hundred and four to seven or thirty to one against the non-eminent son of a judge having an eminent child these figures in these two categories are clearly too few to justify us in relying on them except so far as to show that the probability of a judge having an eminent grandson is largely increased if his sons are also eminent it follows that the sons or daughters of distinguished men who are themselves gifted with decidedly high ability as tested at the university or elsewhere cannot do better than marry early in life if they have a large family the odds are in their favour that one at least of their children will be eminently successful in life and will be a subject of pride to them and a help to the rest let us for a moment consider the bearing of the facts just obtained on the theory of an aristocracy where able men earn titles and transmit them by descent through the line of their eldest male representatives the practice may be justified on two distinct grounds on the one hand the future peer is reared in a home full of family traditions that form his disposition on the other hand he is presumed to inherit the ability of the founder of the family the former is a real justification for the law of primogeniture as applied to titles and possessions the latter as we see from the table is not a man who has no able ancestor nearer in blood to him than a great-grandparent is inappreciably better off in the chance of being himself gifted with ability than if he had been taken out of the general mass of men an old peerage is a valueless title to natural gifts except so far as it may have been furbished up by succession of wives into marriages when however as is often the case the direct line has become extinct and the trust to a distant relative who has not been reared in the family traditions the sentiment that is attached to its possession is utterly unreasonable i cannot think of any claim to respect put forward in modern days that is so entirely an imposture as that made by a peer on the ground of descent who 
who has neither been nobly educated nor has any eminent kinsman within three degrees i will conclude this chapter with a few facts i have derived from my various jottings concerning the natural history of judges it appears that the parentages of the judges in the last six reigns viz since the accession of george the first is as follows reckoning in percentages noble honourable or baronet but not judges nine landed gentlemen thirty five judge barrister or attorney fifteen bishop or clergyman eight medical seven merchants and various unclassed ten tradesmen seven unknown nine there is therefore no very marked class peculiarity in the origin of the judges they seem to be derived from much the same sources as the scholars of our universities with a decided but not excessive preponderance in favour of legal parents i also thought it worth while to note the order in which the judges stood in their several families to see whether ability affected the eldest more than the youngest or if any important fact of the kind might appear i find in my notes that i have recorded the order of the birth of seventy-two judges the result of the percentages is that the judge was an only son in eleven cases eldest in seventeen second in thirty-eight third in twenty-two fourth in nine fifth in one and of yet later birth in two instances it is clear that the eldest sons do not succeed as judges half as well as their cadets i suppose that social influences are on the whole against their entering or against their succeeding at the law End of chapter six of Hereditary Genius. Chapter seven of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter seven statesmen i propose in this chapter to discuss the relationships of modern english statesmen it is my earnest desire throughout this book to steer safely between two dangers on the one hand of accepting mere official position or notoriety with a more discriminative reputation and on the other of an unconscious bias towards facts most favourable to my argument in order to guard against the latter danger i employ groups of names selected by others and to guard against the former i adopt selections that command general confidence it is especially important in dealing with statesmen whose eminence as such is largely affected by the accident of social position to be cautious in both these respects it would not be a judicious plan to take for our select list the names of privy councillors or even of cabinet ministers for though some of them are illustriously gifted and many are eminently so yet others belong to a decidedly lower natural grade for instance it seemed in late years to have become a mere incident to the position of a great territorial duke to have a seat in the cabinet as a minister of the crown no doubt some few of the dukes are highly gifted but it may be affirmed with equal assurance that the abilities of the large majority are very far indeed from justifying such an appointment again the exceptional position of a cabinet minister cannot possibly be a just criterion of a correspondingly exceptional share of natural gifts because statesmanship is not an open profession it was much more so in the days of pocket boroughs when the young men of really high promise were eagerly looked for by territorial magnates and brought into parliament and kept there to do gladiatorial battle for one or other of the great contending parties of the state with those exceptions parliamentary life was not even then an open career for only favoured youths were admitted to compete but as is the case in every other profession none except those who are extraordinarily and particularly gifted are likely to succeed in parliamentary life unless engaged in it from their early manhood onwards dudley north of whom i spoke in the chapter on judges was certainly a great success so in recent times was lord george bentinck so in one way or another was the duke of wellington and other cases could easily be quoted of men beginning their active parliamentary life in advanced manhood and nevertheless achieving success but as a rule to which there are very few exceptions statesmen consist of men who had obtained it little matters how the privilege of entering parliament in early life and of being kept there every cabinet is necessarily selected from a limited field no doubt it always contains some few persons of very high natural gifts who would have found their way to the front under any reasonably fair political regime but it also invariably contains others who would have fallen far behind in the struggle for place and influence if all england had been admitted on equal terms to the struggle 
Two selections of men occurred to me as being, on the whole, well worthy of confidence. One that the premiers began for convenience's sake with the reign of George III, their number is twenty-five, and the proportion of them who cannot claim to be much more than eminently gifted, such as Addington, Pitt is to Addington as London to Paddington, is very small. The other selection is Lord Brougham, statesman of the reign of George III. It consists of no more than fifty-three men, selected as the foremost statesmen in that long reign. Now of these, eleven are judges, and I may add, seven of those judges were described in the appendix to the last chapter, viz. Lords Camden, Eldon, Erskine, Ellenborough, King, Mansfield, and Thurlow. The remaining four are Chief Justices Burke and Gibbs, Sir William Grant, and Lord Lowborough. Lord Browham's list also contains the name of Lord Nelson, which will be more prominently included among the commanders, and that of Earl St. Vincent, which may remain in this chapter, for he was a very able administrator, in peace as well as a naval commander. In addition to these are the names of nine premiers, of whom one is the Duke of Wellington, whom I count here, and again among the commanders, leaving a net balance in the selection made by Lord Browham of thirty-one new names to discuss. The total of the two selections, omitting the judges, is 57. The average natural ability of these men may very justly be stated as superior to class upper F. Canning, Fox, the two Pitts, Romilly, Sir Robert Walpole, whom Lord Browham imports into his list, the Marquess of Wellesley, and the Duke of Wellington, probably exceed upper G. It will be seen how extraordinary are the relationships of these families. The kinship of the two pits, father and son, is often spoken of as a rare, if not sole, instance of high genius being hereditary, but the remarkable kinships of William Pitt were yet more widely diffused. He was not only son of a premier, but nephew of another, George Grenville, and cousin of a third, Lord Grenville. Besides this, he had the temple blood. His pedigree, which is given in the appendix to this chapter, does scant justice to his breed. The fox pedigree is also very remarkable in its connection with the Lords Holland and the Napier family, but one of the most conspicuous is that of the Marquess of Wellesley, a most illustrious statesman both in India and at home, and his younger brother, the great Duke of Wellington. It is also curious from the fact of the Marquess possessing very remarkable gifts as a scholar and critic. They distinguish him in early life and descended to his son, the late principal of New Inn Hall at Oxford, but they were not shared by his brother. Yet although the great duke had nothing of the scholar or art critic in him, he had qualities akin to both. His writings are terse and nervous, and eminently effective. His furniture, equipages and the like were characterised by unostentatious completeness and efficiency under a pleasing form. I do not intend to go seratim through the many names mentioned in my appendix. The reader must do that for himself, and he will find it well worth his while to do so but I shall content myself here with sending the same convenient statistical form that I have already employed for the judges, and arguing on the same basis that the relationships of the statesmen abundantly prove the hereditary character of their genius. In addition to the English statesmen of whom I have been speaking, I thought it well to swell their scanty numbers by adding a small supplementary list, taken from various periods in other countries. I cannot precisely say how large was the area of selection from which this list was taken. I can only assure the reader that it contains a considerable proportion of the names that seemed to me the most conspicuous among these that i found described at length in ordinary small biographical dictionaries table one is displayed on the page summary of relationships of thirty-five english statesmen grouped into thirty families table two is displayed on the page with degree of kinship and the corresponding letters first have the ablest statesmen the largest number of able relatives table one answers this in the affirmative there can be no doubt that its third section contains more illustrious names than the first, and that the more the reader will take the pains of analysing and weighing the relationships, the more I am sure he will find this truth to become apparent. Again, the statesmen as a whole are far more eminently gifted than the judges. Accordingly, it will be seen in Table 2, by a comparison of its column B with the corresponding column in page 61, that their relations are more rich in ability. To proceed to the next list we see that the third section is actually longer than either the first or the second, showing that ability is not distributed at haphazard, but that it affects certain families. Thirdly, the statesman type of ability is largely transmitted or inherited. It would be tedious to count the instances in favour. Those to the contrary are Disraeli, Sir P. Francis, who was hardly a statesman, but rather a bitter controversialist, and Horner, 
in all the other thirty five or thirty six cases in my appendix one or more statesmen will be found among their eminent relations in other words the combination of high intellectual gifts tact in dealing with men power of expression and debate and ability to endure exceedingly hard work is hereditary table two proves just as distinctly as it did in the case of the judges that the nearer kinsmen of the eminent statesmen are far more rich in ability than the more remote it will be seen that the law of distribution as gathered from these instances is very similar to what we had previously found it to be i shall not stop here to compare that law in respect to the statesmen and the judges for i propose to treat all the groups of eminent men from whom the subject of my several chapters in a precisely similar manner and to collate the results once for all at the end of the book end of chapter seven chapter eight of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recorded by leon harvey chapter eight english peerages their influence upon race it is frequently and justly remarked that the families of great men are apt to die out and it is argued from the fact that men of ability are unprolific if this were the case every attempt to produce a highly gifted race of men would eventually be defeated gifted individuals might be reared but they would be unable to maintain their breed i propose in a future chapter after i have discussed the several groups of eminent men to examine the degree in which transcendent genius may be correlated with sterility but it will be convenient that i should now say something about the case of failure of issue of judges and statesmen and come to some conclusion whether or no a breed of men gifted with the average ability of those eminent men could or could not maintain itself during an indefinite number of consecutive generations i will even go a little further afield and treat of the extinct peerages generally first as to the judges there is a peculiarity in their domestic relations that interferes with a large average of legitimate families lord campbell states in a footnote to his life of lord chancellor thurlow in the lives of the chancellors that when he lord campbell was first acquainted with the english bar one half of the judges had married their mistresses he says it was then the understanding that when a barrister was elevated to the bench he should either marry his mistress or put her away according to this extraordinary statement it would appear that much more than one half of the judges that sat on the bench at the beginning of the century had no legitimate offspring before the advanced period of their lives at which they were appointed judges one half of them could not because it was at that stage in their career that they married their mistresses and there were others who having them put away their mistresses were for the first time able to marry nevertheless I have shown that the number of the legitimate children of the judges is considerable, and that even under that limitation they are, on the whole, by no means an unfertile race. Bearing in mind what I have just stated, it must follow that they are extremely prolific. Nay, they are occasional instances of enormous families in all periods of their history, but do not the families die out? I will examine into the descendants of those judges whose names are to be found in the appendix to the chapter upon them, who gain peerages and who last sat on the bench previous to the close of the reign of George IV. There are thirty-one of them, nineteen of the peerages remain, and twelve are extinct. Under what conditions did these twelve become extinct? Were any of those conditions peculiar to the twelve, and not shared by the remaining nineteen? In order to obtain an answer to these inquiries, I examined into the number of children and grandchildren of all the thirty-one peers, and into the particulars of their alliances, and tabulated them, when, to my astonishment, i found a very simple adequate and novel explanation of the common cause of extinction of peerages staring me in the face it appeared in the first instance that a considerable proportion of the new peers and of their sons married heiresses their motives for doing so are intelligible enough and not to be condemned they have a title and perhaps a sufficient fortune to transmit to their eldest son but they want an increase of possessions for the endowment of their younger sons and their daughters on the other hand an heiress has a fortune but wants a title thus the peer and heiress are urged to the same issue of marriage by different impulses but by statistical lists showed with unmistakable emphasis that these marriages are particularly unprolific we might indeed have expected that a heiress who is the sole issue of a marriage and would not be so fertile as a woman who has many brothers and sisters comparative infertility must be hereditary in the same way as other physical attributes 
and I am assured it is so in the case of the domestic animals. Consequently, the issue of a peer's marriage with a heiress frequently fails, and his title is brought to an end. I will give the following list of every case in the first or second generation of the law lords, taken from the English judges within the limits I have already specified, where there has been a marriage with a heiress or a co heiress and I will describe the result in each instance. Then I will summarise the facts. Influence of heiress marriages on the families of those English judges who obtained peerages, and who last sat on the bench between the beginning of the reign of Charles II and at the end of the reign of George IV. The figures within parenthesis give the data of their peerages. Culpepper, First Lord, 1664, married twice, and at issue by both marriages, in all five sons and four daughters. The eldest son married an heiress and died without issue. The second son married a co-heiress and only one daughter. The third married but had no children, and the other two never married at all, so the title became extinct. Cooper, first Earl of Shaftesbury, 1672. His mother was a sole heiress. He married three times and had only one son. However, the son was prolific, and the direct male line continues. Cowper, 1st Earl, 1718. First wife was a heiress. He had no surviving issue by her. His second wife had two sons and two daughters. His eldest son married a co-heiress for his first wife and had only one son and one daughter. The direct male line continues. Finch, 1st Earl of Nottingham, 1681. Had 14 children. The eldest married a co-heiress for his first wife and had only one daughter by her. Harcourt, 1st Lord, 1712, had three sons and two daughters. Two of the sons died young, the eldest married an heiress, whose mother was a heiress also. He had by her two sons and one daughter. Both of the sons married and both died issueless, so the title became extinct. Henley, 1st Earl of Nottingham, 1764, his mother was a co-heiress. He married and had one son and five daughters. The son died unmarried and so the title became extinct. Hyde, 1st Earl Clarendon, 1661, married a lady who was eventually so heiress and had four sons and two daughters by her. The third son died unmarried and the fourth was drowned at sea. Consequently, there remained only two available sons to carry on the family. Of these, the eldest who became the second Earl married a lady who died, leaving an only son. He then married for his second wife an heiress, who had no issue at all. The only son had but one male child who died in youth and was succeeded in the title by the descendants of the first earl's second son he the son of a heiress had only one son and four daughters and his son who was fourth earl of clarendon had only one son and two daughters the son died young so the title became extinct jeffreys first lord of wem 1685 had one son and two daughters the son married an heiress and had only one daughter so the title became extinct Kenyon, 1st Lord, 1788, had three sons, although one of them married a co-heiress. There were numerous descendants in the next generation. North, 1st Lord Guilford, 1683, married a co-heiress. He had only one grandson, who, however, lived and had children. Parker, 1st Earl of Macclesfield, 1721. The family has narrowly escaped extinction, threatened continually by its numerous errors of alliance. The first earl married a co-heiress and had only one son and one daughter. The son married a co-heiress and had two sons of these. The second married a co-heiress and had no issue at all. The eldest son, grandson of the first earl, was therefore the only male that remained in the race. He had two sons and one daughter. Now of these two, only one male hire in the third generation, one married a co-heiress and had only one daughter. The remaining one fortunately married twice, for by the first marriage he had only daughters. A son by the second marriage is the present peer, and is the father by two marriages, in either case with an heiress of eleven sons and four daughters. Pratt, 1st Earl of Camden, 1786. This family affords a similar instance to the last one of impending destruction of the race. The first Earl married an heiress, and had only one son and four daughters. The second married an heiress, and had only one son and three daughters. This son married a co-heiress, but fortunately had three sons and eight daughters. Raymond, 1st Lord, 1731. He had one son who married a co-heiress and left no issue at all, so the title became extinct. Scott, Lord Stowell, 
See further on under my list of statesmen. Talbot, First Lord, 1733. This family narrowly escaped extinction. The First Lord buried in Hyrus and had three sons. The eldest son married in Hyrus and had only one daughter. The second son married a co Hyrus and had no issue by her. However, she died, and he married again, and left four sons. The third son of the first earl had male issue. Trevor, first lord, 1711, married a co hires and had two sons and three daughters. Both of the sons married, but they had only one daughter each. Lord Trevor married again and had three sons, of whom one died young, and the other two, though they married, left no issue at all. Wedderburn, first lord, Lalbro, and earl of Rosslyn. 1801. Married in high arrest for his first wife and had no issue at all. He married again, somewhat late in life, and had no issue, so the direct male line is extinct. York. First Earl of Hardwick, 1754. He is numerously represented, though two of his lines of descent have failed, in one of which there was a marriage with a co heiress The result of all these facts is exceedingly striking. It is, first, that out of the thirty-one peerages, there were no less than seventeen influence of a hyrus or a co hyrus affected the first or second generation. That this influence was sensibly an agent in producing stability in sixteen out of these seventeen peerages, and the influence was sometimes shown in two, three, or more cases in one peerage. Second, that the direct line of no less than eight peerages, viz. Culpepper, Harcourt, Northington, Clarendon, Jeffreys, Raymond, Trevor, and Rosalind were actually extinguished through the influence of the Hyrus, and that six others, viz. Shaftesbury, Cowper, Guildford, Parker, Camden, and Talbot, had very narrow escapes from extinction, owing to the same cause. I literally have only one case, that of Lord Kenyon, where the race destroying influence of Hyrus blood was not felt. Third, out of the twelve peerages that have failed in the direct male line, no less than eight failures are accounted for by Hyrus marriages. Now, what are the four that remain? Lord Summers and Thurlow both died unmarried. Lord Alvany had only two sons, of whom one died unmarried. There is only his case and that of the Earl of Mansfield out of the ten who married and whose titles have since become extinct, where the extinction may not be accounted for by Hyrus marriages. No one can therefore maintain, with any show of reason, that there are grounds for imputing exceptional stability to the race of judges. The facts, when carefully analysed, point very strongly in the opposite direction. I will now treat the statesman of George III and the premier since the ascension of George III, down to recent times, in the same way as I have treated the judges, including, however, only those whose pedigrees I can easily find, namely, such as were peers or nearly related peers. There are twenty-two of these names. I find that fourteen have left no male descendants, and that seven of those fourteen peers or their sons have married heiresses, namely Canning, Castlereagh, Lord Grenville, George Grenville, Lord Holland, Lord Stowell, and Walpole, the first Earl of Oxford. On the other hand, I find only three cases of peers marrying heiresses without failure of issue, namely Addington, Lord Sidmouth, the Marquess of Boot, and the Duke of Grafton. The seven whose male line became extinct from other causes are Bolingbroke, Earl Chatham, Lord Liverpool, Earl St. Vincent, Earl Nelson, William Pitt, unmarried, and the Marquess of Wellesley, who left illegitimate issue. The remaining five required to complete the twenty-two cases are the Duke of Bedford, Dundas, Viscount Melville, Percival, Romilly, and Wilberforce. None of these were allied or descended from Hyra's blood and they have all left descendants. I append to this summary the history of the Hyrus marriages, to correspond with what has already been given in respect to the judges. Boot, Marquess of married a co hires but had a large family. Canning, George, married an Hyrus, and had three sons and one daughter. The eldest died young, and the second was drowned in youth, and the third, who was the late Earl Canning, married a co hires and had no issue, so the line is extinct. Castlereagh, Viscount, married a co hires and had neither son nor daughter, so the line became extinct. Grafton, Duke of, married an heiress, and had two sons and one daughter. By a second wife, he had a large family. Grenville, Lord, had three sons and four daughters. The eldest son married a heiress and had no male grandchildren. The second was apparently unmarried. 
The third was George Grenville, Premier. He married, but was issueless, so the line is extinct. Holland, Lord, had one son and one daughter. The son married an heiress and had only one son and one daughter. The son died issueless, so the male line is extinct. Rockingham, second Marquess, married an heiress and had no issue, so the title became extinct. Sidmouth, Viscount Addington, was son of a heiress and had only one son and four daughters. The son had numerous descendants. Stowell, Lord, married a co heiress. He had only one son who died unmarried and one daughter, so the male line is extinct. Walpole, first Lord of Oxford, had three sons and two daughters. The eldest son married an heiress and had only one son who died unmarried. The second and third sons died unmarried, so the male line is extinct. The important result disclosed by these facts that intermarriage with heiresses is a notable agent in the extinction of families is confirmed by more extended inquiries. I devoted some days to ransacking Burke's volumes on the extant and on the extinct peerages. I first tried the marriages made by the second peers of each extant title. It seemed reasonable to expect that the eldest son of the first peer, the founder of the title, would marry heiresses pretty frequently, and so they do, and with terrible destruction to their race. I examined one-seventh part of the peerage, leaving out co heiresses for I shall weary the reader if I refine overmuch. The following were the results. A table is presented on the page with number of cases. 1. Abington, 2nd Earl, wife and mother, both heiresses, no issue. 2. Aldborough, 2nd Earl, married two heiresses, no issue. 1. Annesley, 2nd Earl, wife and mother, both heiresses, three sons and two daughters. 1. Aaron, 2nd Earl, wife and mother, both heiresses, four sons and three daughters. 1. His son, the 3rd Earl, married an heiress and had no issue. 1. Ashburnham, 2nd Baron, wife and mother, both heiresses, no issue. 1. His brother succeeded as 3rd Earl and married an heiress. By her, no issue. 1. Aylesford, 2nd Earl, wife heiress, mother co heiress, one son and three daughters. 1. Barrington, second Viscount, wife and mother both heiresses, no issue. 2. Beaufort, second Duke, married, two heiresses, by one no issue, by the other two sons. 1. Bedford, second Duke, married heiress, two sons and two daughters. 1. Camden, second Earl, wife and mother both heiresses, one son and three daughters. Number of cases total 14. Making a grand total of 14 cases out of 70 peers, resulting in 8 instances of absolute sterility and in 2 instances of only one son. I tried the question from another side by taking the marriages of the last peers and comparing the numbers of the children when the mother was a heiress and those when she was not. I took precautions to exclude from the latter all cases where the mother was a co-heiress or the father an only son. Also, since heiresses are not so very common, I sometimes went back two or three generations for an instance of an heiress marriage. In this way I took fifty cases of each. I give them below, having first doubled the actual results, in order to turn them into percentages. A table is presented at the page, with three columns going straight down. The number of sons to each marriage, and one hundred marriages of each description split in two columns, number of cases in which the mother was a heiress, and the number of cases in which the mother was not a heiress. I find that among the wives of peers, 100 who are heiresses have 208 sons and 206 daughters. 100 who are not heiresses have 336 sons and 284 daughters. The table shows how exceedingly precarious must be the line of a descent from an heiress, especially when younger sons are not apt to marry. One-fifth of heiresses have no male children at all. Full-third have not more than one child. Three-fifths have not more than two. It has been the salvation of many families that the husband outlived the heiress whom he first married and was able to leave issue by a second wife. Every advancement in dignity is a fresh inducement to the introduction of another heiress into the family. Consequently, dukes have a greater impregnation of heiress blood than earls, and dukedoms might be expected to be more frequently extinguished than earldoms, and earldoms to be more apt to go than baronies. Experience shows this to be most decidedly the case. Sir Bernard Burke, in his preface to the extent peerages, states that all the English dukedoms created from the commencement of the order down to the commencement of the reign of Charles II 
are gone excepting three that emerged in royalty and that only eleven earldoms remain out of the many created by the normans plantagenets and tudors this concludes my statistics about the hyruses i do not care to go farther because one ought to know something more about their several histories before attempting to arrive at very precise results in respect to their facility a heiress is not always the sole child of a marriage contracted early in life and during for many years she may be the surviving child of a larger family or the child of a late marriage or the parents may have early left her an orphan we ought also to consider the family of the husband whether he be a sole child or one of a large family these matters would afford a very instructive field of inquiry to those who care to labour in it but it falls outside my line of work the reason I have gone so far is simply to know that, although many men of eminent ability, I do not speak of illustrious or prodigious genius, have not left descendants behind them, it is not because they are sterile, but because they are apt to marry sterile women, in order to obtain wealth to support the peerages with which their merits have been rewarded. I look upon the peerage as a disastrous institution, owing to its destructive effects on our valuable races. The most highly gifted men are ennobled their elder sons attempt to marry heiresses, and their younger ones not to marry at all, for these have not enough fortune to support both a family and an aristocratical position. So the side shoots of the genealogical tree are hacked off, and the leading shoot is blighted, and the breed is lost forever. It is with much satisfaction that I have traced, and, I hope, finally disposed of the cause why families are apt to become extinct in proportion to their dignity, chiefly so on account of my desire to show that able races are not necessarily sterile as secondarily because it may put an end to the wild and ludicrous hypothesis that are frequently stated to account for their extinction end of chapter eight of hereditary genius chapter nine of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 9. Commanders. In times of prolonged war, when the reputation of a great commander can alone be obtained, the profession of arms affords a career that offers its full share of opportunities to men of military genius. Promotion is quick. The demand for able men is continuous, and very young officers have frequent opportunities of showing their powers. Hence it follows that the list of great commanders, notwithstanding it is short, contains several of the most gifted men recorded in history. They showed enormous superiority over their contemporaries by excelling in many particulars. They were foremost in their day, among statesmen and generals, and their energy was prodigious. Many, when they were mere striplings, were distinguished for political capacity. In their early manhood, they bore the whole weight and responsibility of government. They animated armies and nations with their spirit. They became the champions of great coalitions and coerced millions of other men by the superior power of their own intellect and will. I will run through a few of these names in the order in which they will appear in the appendix to this chapter, to show what giants in ability at their acts proved them to have been and how great and original was the position they occupied at ages when most youths are kept in the background of general society and hardly suffered to express opinions much less to act contrary to the prevailing sentiments of the day alexander the great began his career of conquest at the age of twenty having previously spent four years at home in the exercise of more or less sovereign power with a real statesmanlike capacity his life's work was over at thirty-two Bonaparte, the Emperor Napoleon I, was general of the Italian army at twenty-six, and thenceforward carried everything before him, whether in the field or in the state, in rapid succession. He was made emperor at thirty-five, and had lost Waterloo at forty-six. Caesar, though he was prevented by political hindrances from attaining high office and from commanding in the field till at forty-two, was a man of the greatest political promise as a youth, nay, even as a boy. Charlemagne began his wars at thirty. Charles Twelfth of Sweden began at eighteen, and his ability showed by him at the early period of life was of the highest order. Prince Eugene commanded the imperial army in Austria at twenty-five. Gustavus Apolphus 
was as precocious in war and statesmanship as his descendant charles twelfth hannibal and his family were remarkable for their youthful superiority many of them had obtained the highest commands and had become the terror of the romans before they were what we call of age the nassau family are equally not worthy when william the silent was a mere boy he was a trusted confidant even adviser of the emperor charles v his son the great general maurice of nassau was only eighteen when in chief command of the low countries then risen in arms against the spaniards his grandson turenne the gifted french general and his great-grandson our william the third were both of them illustrious in early life marlborough was from forty-six to fifty years of age during the period of his great success but he was treated much earlier as a man of high mark scopio africanus major was only twenty-four when in chief command in spain against the carthaginians wellington broke the Mahratta power at thirty-five and had won waterloo at forty-six but though the profession of arms in time of prolonged war affords ample opportunities to men of high military genius it is otherwise in peace or in short wars the army in every country is more directly under the influence of the sovereign than any other institution guided by the instinct of self-preservation the patronage of the army is always the last privilege that sovereigns are disposed to yield to democratic demands hence it is that armies invariably suffer from those evils that are inseparable from courtly patronage rank and political services are apt to be weighed against military ability and incapable officers to occupy high places during periods of peace they may even be able to continue to fill their posts during short wars without creating a public scandal nay sometimes to carry away honours that ought in justice to have been bestowed on the more capable subordinates in rank it is therefore very necessary in accepting the reputation of a commander as a test of his gifts to confine ourselves as i propose to do to those commanders only whose reputation has been tested by prolonged wars or whose ascendancy over other men has been freely acknowledged there is a singular and curious condition of success in the army and navy quite independent of ability that deserves a few words in order that a young man may fight his way to the top of his profession he must survive many battles but it so happens that men of equal ability are not equally likely to escape shot free before explaining why let me remark that the danger of being shot in battle is considerable no less than seven out of the thirty-two commanders mentioned in my appendix or between one quarter and one fifth of them perished in that way they are charles twelfth gustavus adolphus sir henry lawrence sir john moore nelson tromp and Turenne. i may add well talking of these things though it does not bear on my argument that four others were murdered viz caesar coligny philip the second of macedon and william the silent and that two committed suicide viz lord clive and hannibal in short forty per cent of the whole number died by violent deaths there is a principle of natural selection in an enemy's bullets which bears more heavily against large than against small men large men are more likely to be hit i calculate that the chance of man being accidentally shot as in the square root of the product of his height multiplied into his weight that where a man of sixteen stone in weight and six feet two point five inches high will escape from chance shots for two years a man of eight stone in weight and five feet six inches high would escape for three but the total proportion of the risk run by the large man is i believe considerably greater he is conspicuous from his size and is therefore more likely to be recognized and made the object of a special aim it is also in human nature that the shooter should pick out the largest man just as he would pick out the largest bird in a covey or antelope in a herd again of two men who are aimed at the bigger is the more likely to be hit and affording a larger target this chance is a trifle less than the ratio of his increased sectional area for it is subject to the law discussed on page twenty eight though we are unable to calculate the decrease from our ignorance of the average distance of the enemy and the closeness of his fire at long distances and when the shooting was wild the decrease would be insensible at comparatively close ranges it would be unimportant for even the sums of a and b page thirty four are only about one fifth more than two a in the last column of the table seventy seven plus forty eight equals one hundred twenty five is only twenty one about one fifth more than two multiplied by forty eight equals ninety six as a matter of fact 
commanders are very frequently the objects of special aim i remember when salt visited england that a story appeared in the newspapers of some english veteran having declared the hero must have lived a charmed life for he had covered him with his rifle i think my memory does not deceive me upwards of thirty times and yet never the fortune to hit him nelson was killed by one of many shots aimed directly at him by a rifleman in the main top of the french vessel with which his own was closely engaged the total relative chances that being shot in battle of two men of the respective heights and weights i have described are as three to two in favour of the smaller man in respect to accidental shots and in a decidedly more favourable in respect to direct aim the latter chance being compounded of the two following first a better hope of not being aimed at and second hope very little less than three to two of not being hit when made the object of an aim this is really an important consideration had nelson been a large man instead of a mere featherweight the probability is that he would not have survived so long let us for a moment consider the extraordinary dangers he survived leaving out of consideration the early part of his active service which was only occasionally hazardous as also the long interval of peace that followed it we find him at thirty-five engaged in active warfare with the french when through his energy at bastia and calvi his name became dreaded throughout the mediterranean at thirty-seven he retained great renown from his share in the battle of st vincent he was afterwards under severe fire at cadiz also at tenerife where he lost an arm by a cannon shot he then received a pension of one thousand pounds a year the memorial which he was required to present on his occasion stated that he had been in action one hundred and twenty times and speaks of other severe wounds besides the loss of his arm and eye at forty he gained the victory of the nile where the contest was most bloody he thereupon was created baron nelson with a pension of three thousand pounds a year and received the thanks of parliament he was also made duke of bronte by the king of naples and he became idolized in england at forty three he was engaged in the severe battle of copenhagen and at forty seven was shot at trafalgar thus his active career extended throughout twelve years during the earlier part of which he was much more frequently under fire than afterwards had he only lived through two-thirds or even three-fourths of his battles he could not have commanded at denial copenhagen or trafalgar his reputation under those circumstances would have been limited to that of a dashing captain or a young and promising admiral wellington was a small man if he had been shot in the peninsula his reputation though it would have undoubtedly been very great would have lost the lustre of waterloo in short to have survived is an essential condition to becoming a famed commander yet persons equally endowed with military gifts such as the requisite form of high intellectual and moral ability and of constitutional vigour are by no means equally qualified to escape shot free the enemy's bullets are least dangerous to the smallest man and therefore small men are more likely to achieve high fame as commanders than their equally gifted contemporaries whose physical frames are larger i now give tables on precisely the same principle as those in previous chapters table one is displayed on the page summary of relationships of thirty-two commanders grouped into twenty-seven or twenty-four families table two is also displayed on the page with three main columns including the degree of kinship and the corresponding letters precisely similar conclusions are to be drawn from these tables as from those i have already given but they make my case much stronger than before i argue that the more able the man the more numerous ought his able kinsmen to be that in short the names on the third section of table one should on the whole be those of men of greater weight than are included in the first section there cannot be a shadow of doubt that this is the fact but the table shows more its third section is proportionally longer than it was in the statesmen and it was longer in these than in the judges now the average natural gifts of the different groups are proportioned in precisely the same order the commanders are more able than the statesmen and the statesmen are more able than the judges consequently comparing the three groups together we find the abler men to have on the average the larger number of able kinsmen similarly the proportion borne by those commanders who have any eminent relations at all to those who have not is much greater than it is in statesmen and in these much greater than in the judges their peculiar type of ability is largely transmitted 
my limited list of commanders contains several notable families of generals that of william the silent is a most illustrious family and i must say that in at least two out of his four wives namely the daughter of the elector of saxony and that of the great coligny he could not have married more discreetly to have had maurice of nassau for a son turin for a grandson and our william the third for a great-grandson is a marvellous instance of hereditary gifts another most illustrious family is that of charlemagne first pepin de heristal virtual sovereign of france then his son charles martel who drove back the saracenic invasion that had overspread the half of france then his grandson pepin the brief the founder of the carlovingian dynasty and lastly his great grandson charlemagne founder of the germanic empire the three that come last if not the whole of the four were of the very highest rank as leaders of men another yet more illustrious family is that of alexander including philip of macedon and his second cousin Phyrus. i acknowledge the latter to be a far-off relation but Phyrus so nearly resembles alexander in character that i am entitled to claim his gifts as hereditary another family is that of hannibal his father and his brothers again there is that of the scipios also the interesting near relationship between marlborough and the duke of berwick rayleigh's kinships are exceedingly appropriate to my argument as affording excellent instances of hereditary special aptitudes i have spoken in the last chapter about wellington and of the marquess of wellesley so i need not repeat myself here of commanders of high but not equally illustrious stamp i should mention the family of napier of lawrence and the singular naval race of hyde parker there were five brothers grant all highly distinguished in wellington's campaigns i may as well mention that though i know too little about the great asiatic warriors genghis khan and timurlane to insert them in my appendix yet they are doubtly though very distantly interrelated the distribution of ability among the different degrees of kinship will be seen to follow much the same order as it did in the statesmen and in the judges End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 10 Literary Men. Those who are familiar with the appearance of great libraries and have endeavoured to calculate the number of famed authors those works they include cannot fail to be astonished at their multitude the years go by and every nation produces literary works of sterling value and stores of books have accumulated for centuries among the authors who are the most eminent this is a question i feel incompetent to answer it would not be difficult to obtain lists of the most notable literary characters of particular periods but I have found none that afford a compact and trustworthy selection of the great writers of all times. Mere popular fame in after ages is an exceedingly uncertain test of merit because authors become obsolete. Their contributions to thought and language are copied and recopied by others, and at length they have become so incorporated into the current literature and expressions of the day that nobody cares to trace them back to their original sources any more than they interest themselves in tracing the gold converted into sovereigns to the nuggets from which it was derived or to the gold diggers who discovered the nuggets again a man of fair ability who employs himself in literary turns out a great deal of good work there is always a chance that some of it may attain a reputation very far superior to its real merits because the author may have something to narrate which the world wants to hear or he may have had particular experiences which qualify him to write works of fiction or otherwise to throw out views singularly opposite to the wants of the time but of no importance in after years here also fame misleads under these circumstances i thought it best not to occupy myself over much with older times otherwise i should have been obliged to quote largely in justification of my lists of literary worthies but rather to select authors of modern date or those whose reputation has been freshly preserved in england i have therefore simply gone through dictionaries extracted the names of literary men whom i found the most prominent and have described those who had decidedly eminent relations in my appendix 
I have therefore left out several whom others might with reason judge worthy to have appeared. My list is a very incongruous collection, for it includes novelists, historians, scholars, and philosophers. There are only two peculiarities common to all these men. The one is a desire of expressing themselves, and the other a love of ideas, rather than of material possessions. Mr. Disraeli, who is himself a good instance of hereditary literary power, in a speech at the anniversary of the Royal Literary Fund, May 6, 1868, described the nature of authors. His phrase epitomizes what has been graphically delineated in his own novels, and I may add, in those of Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, now Lord Lytton, who with his brother Sir Henry Bulwer and his son Owen Meredith, is a still more remarkable example of hereditary literary gifts than Mr. Disraeli. He said, The author, as we must ever remember, a peculiar organization, he is a being with a predisposition which with him is irresistible, a bent which he cannot in any way avoid, whether it drags him to the abstruse researches of erudition or induces him to mount into the fervid and turbulent atmosphere of imagination. The majority of the men described in the appendix to this chapter justified the description by Mr. Disraeli. Again, that the powers of many of them were of the highest order, no one can doubt. Several were prodigies in boyhood, as Grotius, Lessing, and Nebuhr. Many others were distinguished in youth. Charlotte Bront published Jane Eyre at 22. Chetter Briad was of note at an equally early age. Fenelon made an impression with only fifteen. Sir Philip Sidney was of high mark before he was twenty-one, and had acquired his great fame, and won the heart of the nation in a few more years, for he was killed in battle when only thirty-two. I may add that there are occasional cases of great literary men having been the reverse of gifted in youth. Boylau is the only instance in my appendix. He was at Dunstan School, and dull till he was thirty. But among other literary men of whom I have notes, Goldsmith was accounted a dull child, and he was anything but distinguished at Dublin University. He began to write well at thirty-two. Rousseau was thought at Dunstan School when he ran away at sixteen. It is a striking confirmation of what I endeavoured to prove in an early chapter, that the highest order of reputation is independent of external aids, to note how regularly Many of the men and women have been educated whose names appear in my appendix, such as Boileau, the Bront family, Chatterbrayard, Fielding, and two grandmounts, Irving, Karstein, Nybur, Person, in one sense, Roscoe, Le Sage, J. C. Scalinger, Siving, and Swift. I now give my usual table, but I do not specify with confidence the numbers of eminent literary men contained in the thirty-three families it includes. They have many literary relations of considerable merit, but I feel myself unable, for the reasons stated at the beginning of this chapter, to sort out those that are eminent from among them. The families of Taylor, both those in Norwich and those of Ongar, have been inserted as being of great hereditary interest, but only a few of their members, see Austin, are not summed up in the following table. Table 1 is displayed on the page. Summary of relationships of 52 literary persons, grouped into 33 families. The table is broken up into several sections, with one relation or two in the family, two or three relations, or three or four in the family, and four or more relations, or five or more in the family. Table 2 is also displayed on the page, with several columns in three main sections. The degrees of kinship, with the name of the degree and the corresponding letters. It would be both a tedious and unnecessary task if I applied the same test to this table with the same minuteness that they were applied to those inserted in previous chapters. Its contents are closely similar in their general character, and therefore all that can be derived from an analysis of others may, with equal justice, be derived from this. The proportion of eminent grandsons is small, but the total number is insufficient to enable us to draw conclusions from that fact, especially as the number of eminent sons is not small in the same ratio. There are other minor peculiarities which will appear more distinctly when all the corresponding tales are collated and discussed towards the end of the book. In the meantime, we may rest satisfied that an analysis of kinsfolk shows literary genius to be fully as hereditary as any other kind of ability we have 
hitherto discussed. End of chapter 10